Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Hello, we're dealing with verses 4 through 6 today, which basically is the third element of the ten words related to how we respect God. We've, we've talked about um, that He's the God that called us, loved us, graciously brought us. Uh, then we talked about the fact that uh, it's significant that there's no other gods uh, before, beside, after, near Him. Like taking the second wife, He has to be priority, the only lover. And now we come to that statement that says that we aren't to make idols. Now we talked last time about idols and basically... Uh, a lot of the isms that I talked about came out of a book by Eldon Trueblood called The Foundations for Reconstruction. Eldon Trueblood is kind of a, is a philosopher, religious philosopher. And he has taken the Ten Commandments as a little book and has um, seen how they apply to all men and basically for, as a reformation of the foundations of all human societies. It's a very excellent book with some penetrating insight. Although I think he doesn't do exegesis, what he does is trying to apply the universal principle to our day. Uh, let's look at Exodus 20. Let me read these three uh, verses and go back then and comment. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. There is some tremendously rich things there. Uh, and I want to go through, again, I want to use my notes because I really prayed about this as I went through it and I feel like I have some insight from the Lord and I, I don't want any of it to leak out. <laughs> Somebody said, well, you must have a photographic memory. I said, I think I have a photographic memory, but I have a broken developer. It all leaks out after a while. So I'm sure you know what, what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the first aspect in 4A. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. Now, this, of course, is involving uh, idolatry. The word graven image here is the word to hew something, primarily out of wood, later could mean stone, and even later than that, overlaid with metal. But it's man creating his own god. Uh, now, man has always been an extremely uh, religious animal, um, he always has uh, sought God, sought a higher power, as <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous would put it. Um, and yet, at the same time that there's a reverence about the spiritual realm, there is also superstition. Uh, much that goes in the name of faith in our day is simply superstition. And with superstition comes a strange, almost an, an antithetical uh, relationship of trying to manipulate that which is spiritual. It's so easy to manipulate your own God when you carry it around and can put it where you want it, leave it where you want it, and say what you want it to. And man has abused that tremendously. Um, Yahweh cannot be lowered to the level of an idol. He can't be seen as an animistic religion, as a spirit that invades everything. You know, I want to say to you again, I... I just love Star Wars. Boy, I like space shows. But basically the philosophy behind the force is a Hindu pantheistic animism. Some impersonal something out there. Not so with us. Our God is personal, involved, active. And the tragedy of idolatry, be it in the form of uh, some image uh, of nature or some animal, or even being in something like materialism or intellectualism or nationalism or whatever, is that it robs man of that which he needs the most, which is God. I mentioned last week, uh, Augustine said we have a God-shaped hole in our life and nothing will satisfy until we find Him. That's so true. Now, idols are not a bridge to the spiritual realm. They're a barrier to the true spiritual realm. And yet they do reflect man's hunger for God, kind of in a funny, perverted way, but they still show how hungry um, man is for something religious. Uh, usually man worships something of the created order. He, uh, the powers of nature, be it the sun, the moon, the storm, God, whatever, the waters, 
Or he tends to worship some aspect of nature represented in the qualities that certain animals have. Um, it's a tragedy that man has been drawn to the creation instead of the creator. But we see it so clearly, I think, in, in Romans uh, chapters uh, 1, uh, 17 through 3, 20, uh, where man does make representations of birds and fish and bow down and worship them. And that's, of course, the height of pagan religion. And, of course, uh, we may not know it, but our society is extremely pagan in the way it looks at the spiritual realm. Idols usually represent one deity, one aspect of nature, uh, one power in nature. But Yahweh is much grander than one aspect. He can't be just a storm god or just a fertility god. Uh, he is God over all aspects of nature. Nature is in the hand of God. Uh, Psalms 19 verses 1 through 6 describes uh, the sun as a servant of God. It's not independent. Uh, Genesis 1, all of nature is subservient to the Creator and follows Him. And We've lifted the creation above the Creator. God help us. Um, now in verse uh, 4b, nor any likeness of what is in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the water underneath the earth. Now, in light of Israel's use of um, representations of things in heaven in the tabernacle, uh, they had pictures of pomegranates, they had pictures of angels, cherubs, uh, they had bulls out front that the, the, the laver or the washing basin for the priest was on. Uh, they, uh, they had pomegranates around the high priest's clothes and in the temple uh, in in uh, Jesus' day, there was a huge symbol of a vine on uh, Herod's temple, symbolizing Israel as a vine. So what does it mean, no likeness? Does that mean that uh, any art form is displeasing to God, which represents nature? I think not. I think it's real important we see that these first three commandments are linked to the person of God. The idea here is, don't make any image and worship it. Now, it's true that in Jewish history, that, uh, because of this commandment, a lot of... Uh, Art has not been represented uh, fairly in Israel because the artists were not uh, free to make representations because of the misunderstanding of this verse. Because it's linked with the other two verses primarily about God, I think it's make an idol to worship in a worship setting. Don't set up something and worship me by it is what it's like. Not that we should not make any image of things in heaven and on the earth and on the earth. That's a misunderstanding of this. Now, this three-story universe idea that seems to be uh, represented here, I think it's interesting that the ancients described the world in the language of description, not in the language of, of scientific fact. Uh, when they dug a hole in the ground, that water usually filled it, so they said the earth floated on water. Uh, they, they buried their dead like we do, and so their dead live in the ground. Now, that's not a theological statement. Uh, it's not even the statement of a naive people. It is the language of description. And the Bible does depict a three-story universe in the sense of poetry, the language of description. But the Bible is not anti-scientific. It's pre-scientific. And I think it's really, really important uh, that we uh, talk about that. Um, let's see. Okay, number verse 5a. You shall not worship them or serve them. Uh, this also relates directly to the verses before them. And you can see the context is idolatry, not art, idolatry. I once uh, knew a pastor friend who uh, resented the uh, seminary where I went having clay, wax figures of the Lord's Supper, and he quoted this verse. Uh, that, again, is to misunderstand them. It's, to, it's man making something with his own hands and then bowing down and serving it. Well, isn't that the height of folly? that which cannot talk or hear or move or act. And man, because of his overwhelming need for a spiritual reality, a spiritual representation in his life, turns the creation into deity. Uh, Mother Nature is, a, is kind of a same way of doing that. Those who worship nature, sometimes we get so fanatical about nature, we forget that nature is nothing more than the beautiful stage on which the Creator wanted to walk with his ultimate creation man. I think we really need to see that. Now, uh, 7, I mean, excuse me, 5b. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, again, notice these uh, multiplication of terms. The word Lord in all caps is, of course, Y-H-W-H. -H. We think it's from the verb to be. So it's the term Yahweh. You say, well, Bob, I always thought the word was Jehovah. 
You know, Germans were the first to do word studies. And uh, they changed all the Y's in Hebrew. Hebrew does not have a J. And German doesn't have a Y. So they turned all the Y's into J's. They took the vowels from the other name for translated Lord, Adonai or Adon, and put them in Yahweh and made up Jehovah. I think we call God Jehovah. He goes, I beg your pardon? <laughs> but it is the covenant name for God. And it's linked here to the term Elohim, the, the, the representative of power, authority. I am a jealous God. Um, it's significant now that we're using a love word to describe God. We talked about earlier that shall have no God before me was used in the ancient uh, Near East to describe taking a second wife. This is a companion concept. God is jealous. Jealous for what? For your attention, for your love. Isn't it absolutely staggering that the creator God of the universe would be jealous about us? That he would want us to know him? That he would be chasing after us? Uh, really, the parable of the prodigal son is a very good representation of the love of a father. And I think we see it here in the word jealous. He, he will have our total self or he will continue to work with us until he does. And so God is a jealous God. It's a love word. It means to, be, to turn something red, to fa- turn the face to red is the idea. Now, several parallel passages of this concept of jealous that I think you might want to see. You might want to see Exodus 34, 14. Of course, we've read that, quoted that to you in several lessons. It's a very important parallel passage I hope you'll read. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15, and Joshua 24, 19. It seems that Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 19, seems to explain this commandment in light of the formless revelation at Sinai. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, God did not reveal himself through the mouth of animals or, or creation, but he was invisible. Sometimes, uh, remember back in Genesis 17, Yahweh was represented by a, an oven, a flaming oven. Uh, fire has often been associated with the presence of God. But God that revealed himself on Mount Sinai was a formless God. And he preferred not to be worshipped in a form because I guess he knew us well enough. No, we always pervert the form and miss the essence of it. I get so tickled of some of my friends who are, are, are so um, persistent about the ways you should pray and how you should pray and when you should pray and, and how you keep score. Forgetting that the essence of prayer is being with God. We, we desperately need fellowship with God. And idols rob us of that. And sometimes just plain the, our religiosity puts more emphasis on the letter of the law than the law giver. And I think that's important. We see that. Now, in, in uh, verse 5c, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Interesting for me to know uh, the use of the word um, the fathers and the children Quite often in the Bible, it emphasizes that man is responsible. Uh, This passage must be balanced with the fact of the individual responsibility of man. Let me give you a few passages where the Bible really emphasizes that we're responsible for our own sins, not for our father's sins, not for our society's sins. Uh, And here's the passage. Deuteronomy 24, 16, Jeremiah 31, 29 and 30, and Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. In saying that we're not responsible for our parents' sin is not to say we're not affected by them or influenced by them. A, a godless society will pass on to its, its uh, prodigies a godless society. Uh, sometimes the sins of a father, be it alcoholism or uh, child abuse, are often passed on to the children. God help us. Many of us reap that we do not sow. And this seems to be an emphasis on that, that godless parents tend to pass on their godlessness uh, to their children. Um, let's see. This implies that, that one's children reap the consequences uh, of family sin um, and societal sin. This can easily be seen in the kings of Israel. There's an element of truth here. We pass on not only the consequences of sin, but also the lifestyle of sin. You might see Jeremiah 16, uh, 10 through 12. Uh, many of the great men of the Old Testament were not good parents did not teach their children, as Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6 through 9 tells us. And therefore, though they loved God and served others, somehow their own family got uh, left out. And that, boy, I see that in preachers a lot, don't you? God help them. Now, it is interesting to note the black and whiteness of this closing phrase. One either knows, loves, and follows Yahweh, or that one is said to hate Him. There is no middle neutral ground when one is dealing with the only true creator God. 
What do I mean by that? You can't straddle the fence. To not choose to love him and serve him is to choose against him. To not love him is to hate him. Now, of course, this is a Hebrew idiom of comparison. It was uh, first used, I think, in relation to Rachel and Leah. You know, when uh, Jacob loved Rachel and wanted to marry her, worked seven years, but got drunk on his wedding night and woke up with the wrong woman. There's a moral there, friends. <laughs> uh, so he worked seven more years for the wife he, he loved. Now, it says that he loved Rachel but hated Leah. But we know that's not true. He just loved Rachel more. So this is a Hebrew idiom. You've got to love me, number one, might be a good one. I've got to be priority in your life. And the, and the consequences of God not being priority is that the, the idiom of comparison says that he is hated. Uh, I, I think that's a very strong and powerful and needed emphasis in our day where so many people have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. In Second Timothy, um, I believe it's chapter 4, 3 or 4. I think it's significant, though, as so many people in the United States who claim to know God, claim to be a church member, uh, but really their, their church attendance is perfunctory. Uh, their worship is ritual-centered, form-centered. They don't have a warm heart toward God. It's a tragedy that that can happen, but it certainly can happen. Now, in verse 6, it says, But the loving kindness to the thousands of generations of those who love me. Now, watch this. As the sins of the parents are passed on to the children in the sense of of either the consequences of sin or the lifestyle of sin to the third and fourth generations. But, oh, God, help us to the thousand generations of those who love Him. And you say, well, how do you get the word thousand generations out of that? Well, I think it's significant when you look at, uh, I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Let me check that because I think it's so critical. Yes, listen to this. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Knowing therefore the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps His covenant, His loving kindness to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. Uh, notice the idea of keep His commandments is connected with love. Jesus said it so well when He said, Luke six forty six, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do not the things I tell you to do. Obedience is a sign that we love God and know God and the relationship is in place. But isn't it, isn't it beautiful uh, that the, the justice of God runs to the fourth generation, but the mercy of God runs to the thousandth generation? One time, I believe it was Isaiah, says that judgment is God's strange work. I believe that. I think your basic view of what God is like will affect uh, all of your theology and all of your, all of your understanding of the ritual and, and uh, rules of the Bible. One of the greatest truths I ever learned that God loves me and God's on my side. That God's not a cosmic killjoy or a, 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 a heavenly a, a rain on my parade person. He really loves me and He's put some boundaries in life so that I won't hurt myself. And He's put some guidelines so I won't hurt other people. And He showed me by how He acts toward the needy and the lowly, the priority of people. And He's, he's convinced me in the way He deals with sinners that He really is compassionate. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't take sin lightly. But compare third or fourth generation to a thousand generations. You know, there's a real sense, and I believe that what I am today may be because I have godly ancestors that prayed for me and set the foundation in my family of faith. What about you? You ever thought about that? Tradition can be good or bad. Some are nervous about it. But when it's positive, it's wonderfully, wonderfully positive. Um, now, notice if you would, the word loving kindness. This is a wonderful word. It's the Hebrew word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And I, I have a few uh, outlines of that word I want to go over for a minute because I think it's such a significant word. As the word Yahweh refers to the covenant name of God, the mercy of God, the noun hesed refers to how God treats us. So, it speaks something of God's character. Uh, it primarily means God's no-strings-attached covenant loyalty. Uh, it's the focus of faith. See, faith can be translated trust or faith or believe, but it, it's speaking tr of the trustworthiness not of ourselves, but of God. It's God's trustworthiness on which we act, and the word hesed reflects that. I want to give you a few uh, composite uh, ways to look at this verb, if we could. Uh, the loving kindness and mercy of God toward man. Uh, this covenant love is used in several ways. This is kind of long. It'll be in your outline. You'll see it on, uh, there. Uh, covenant love, number one, in redemption from enemies and trouble. Genesis 19.19, 19, 
Genesis 39, 21, Exodus 15, 13. Uh, number two, um, in pers- preservation of life from death is where hesed is used. Psalm 6, verse 5. Psalm 66, 17. Job 10, 12. In quickening the spiritual life, hesed is an important element. Psalms 109, 26. Psalms 119, 41, 76, 88, 124. 149, 159. In forgiveness and redemption from sin, God's trustworthiness and loyalty can be depended on. Psalms 25, 7. Psalms 51, 3. Now, other groupings or characteristics around this word are used to describe Yahweh. Not just what He does for us, but Yahweh Himself. And I think that is very, very beautiful. His kindness and loyalty. Here's just a few verses. Genesis 24, 27. Psalms 25:10, Psalms 40 verse 11, Psalms 57:4, Psalms 61:8, Psalms 85:1, Psalms 115:1, 138:2. You say, why list us all those? Because it shows us the nature of God. And it's my presupposition. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. Now, the next little series of things I want to do is to show you the extent of God's love for us, His covenant people. And there's three things under this. It's abundantly plentiful. It's overflowing. Numbers 14.18 Nehemiah 9.17 Jonah 4.2 Psalms 86.5 and 103.8 It is so great in its extent that it's even to the generations. So we just looked at to the thousandth generation. Exodus 20 verse 6 Deuteronomy 5.10 Deuteronomy 7.9 It's even up to the heavens. Psalms 57.11, Psalms 103.11. The earth is full of it. Psalms 33.5, 119.64. And here's a beautiful one. It is everlasting. It will not come to an end. 1 Chronicles 16, 34 and 31. 2 Chronicles 5.13, 7.3, 7, 7.6. 2 Chronicles 20, 21. Ezra 3.11, Psalms 100 verse 5, 106 verse 1. 107 verse 1, 118 verse 1 and 2, and 3 and 4, and 29, and verse 136, 26. You say, Bob, why would you read all those scriptures to us? Why, why are you doing so many parallel passages? Parallel passages are a way of allowing the Bible to interpret itself. It's a way of finding the biblical definition of words based on how biblical authors use them. Oh, it's significant the word hesed describes not only the action of God, but God himself. Now, it's, it's used in such a way that it's meant to show the action between how men who know God are supposed to relate to other men. Now, the, the significance of that is that God wants His family characteristics in His children. The Ten Commandments are a way to do that. It's reflecting who God is, and the purpose is to make us like God. We would put it in New Testament terms, make us Christ-like. The way God has dealt with us in trust and faith and loyalty is the way we are to deal with others. And I think that is a significant, significant truth. Now, uh, I want to mention verse 6 again. Um, Let's see. God's faithfulness to the covenant is to be reciprocated. Obedience is important. However, it is not just rule keeping, but an attitude of love that issues in obedience that is required. Now, what do I mean by that? I think sometimes people think that all they have to do is keep a few rules and that will make them a good Christian. I grew up in a church, and I, I know love the Lord, and I found the Lord there, but it was kind of like the more things you don't do, the closer you are to God. I have found that's not the case. The focus of the Bible is not just on the thou shalt not. Well, they're certainly there, and when they're there, we don't violate them. But primarily, it's on who we are. It's the positive character of our life. It's the overflow of that river of water, the water of the Holy Spirit starts in our bellies that overflows on others. We treat others because we've been with God. They said to the disciples, they've been with Jesus. They'll know we're Christians by our love, by our love. The Ten Commandments reflect the heart of God. Therefore, God wants that in His people. God wants His people acting to each other the way God acts to us in kindness and love and gentleness and patience and long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is really nothing more than a word picture of Jesus Christ. Christ, and that's to be in our lives. I think it's so important. And the Ten Commandments, I think, reflects that to a thousand generations of those who love me. But notice the condition who keep my commandments. There's been a lot of fight in Old Testament studies about conditional versus unconditional covenants. 
it's my personal belief that all covenants are conditional and unconditional, even though something may not be expressed. Like uh, the covenant with Adam is conditional. Don't eat. But the covenant with Noah is unconditional. I will not destroy. The covenant with Abraham is conditional in, in, in uh, 12 and 15, I mean 12 and 17, but not convi- conditional in 15. So I think I would, as a theologian, put it this way. God always takes the initiative. God always comes to man in love first. But God has chosen that man must respond to him in repentance and faith. That's not just initially, but ongoing. Hopefully, the longer we've known God, the more we're going to be like him. The deeper we know God, the more our life is going to reflect who he is. That does not say we're saved by living a certain life, but it does say this. Once we come to know God by repentance and faith, then our lives will reflect who He is. I guess the best balance on this probably is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you've been saved, the initiating love of God. And that, not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Man can't earn it, can't deserve it. But it's through faith. Now, what's through faith? That's man's response to God's offer. And then look down at verse 10. For you were created in Christ Jesus for good works that it was foreordained you should walk in them. God wants His children just not to get their ticket for heaven, but to live here in such a way, to have such an attractive life that others will come to know God through us, through our changed life, through our living in the midst of crisis, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of problems. There'll be a difference about us that'll draw lost men to God. God's will has always been to choose one man to choose a nation, to choose a world. That's what the Messiah is all about. Uh, so I, I, I think when we see that, we see the real heart of God is toward drawing people to himself. We'll have a different view about God. We'll understand why God does what he does. And I think it'll be helpful. These Ten Commandments are as much based on grace and love as any other part of the Bible. But until we really see that, we're going to miss it. And what God's saying in these first few commands is, I must be priority. No idol. No me. I've enjoyed being with you. Have a good day.